So we continue our lesson about helping people who've been raped. So as I said before, this could be upsetting. So please be aware of that as I'm teaching. Um, so this lecture is especially helping us in our understanding of the impact of rape. So when someone has gone through a traumatic experience, they'll probably ex experience something called post-traumatic distress. So they will they will be physiologically hyper aroused because their ability to defend themselves has been overwhelmed, and therefore they experience a fight, flight, or freeze instinct. I I helped someone who was a very large lady, very very large, and she had always said if any man would ever try anything on her, she would floor him, and she could have, she could have fought off any man, and this poor woman was raped one time and she froze and she felt guilty. Why am I such a wimp that I didn't could have, uh, fight him off? And we discussed this, that there's something physiologically goes on with the human body that people respond in different ways. Uh, she froze. doesn't mean she did anything wrong. She wasn't responsible for what happened. It was helpful for her to realise that she was not to blame. And sometimes people, well-intentioned people, will say, why didn't you fight them off? Um, or they might give a story about someone who did fight someone off and therefore were not raped. These are not helpful because every situation is different. If they think they can't manage the memories of the assault, they could experience a memory block. Uh, so let's look at this, there's hypoarousal. So hypoarousal that they could experience would be to be easily started, startled, sorry, irritable, have outbursts of anger, difficulty concentrating, sleeping problems, could have extreme responses to stimuli, uh, they could experience intrusion, they might relive, relive the late rape and, and the resulting in intruding upon their daily life. They could have flashbacks, nightmares, hallucinations. And you've got this hyper arousal and this intrusion into your daily life. The life could become constricted because the life narrows as they withdraw by avoiding people, places and things that remind them of the attack. And as I said in the previous lesson the, the numbs emotion they could numb their emotions by self-harm overeating abusing drugs or alcohol the life becomes uh, constricted so it's not just the rape itself there's a devastating impact on them on on their life it's it has a long-lasting repercussion as well you got what are known as triggers there's anything that reminds a victim of the attack so there's a whole bunch of things that could remind her the medical examination Smells, odours, fluids, sounds, sights, touches, locations, sexual intercourse with our spouse, anniversary dates, food, furniture, the weather, seasons, times of the day, people who look similar, similar age, similar build, tone of voice, attitude. It's just triggering, remembering what had happened and then, then she has to deal with it all again in her mind. Um, so intrusive thoughts, these are unwanted thoughts that plague their mind and seem impossible to stop and come out of nowhere, just bombarding their thinking. And usually it's worse during the first days and weeks and start to lessen, get less between three to six months later. But it can return after a trigger, even years later. At times I've gone through really upsetting experiences in my life and these, the situation would be on my mind a lot it was just especially at times for example when I'm driving and it's just constantly there you you focus on something else and then it come back it's really important that you work on your thoughts or that she's helped to work on her thoughts because if she doesn't she'll become that um, although it's a lot of hard work and exhausting it's a very she's a very much in a better place if she works on these thoughts otherwise it control her life so flashbacks, uh, those are like as if she's back in, in, in reliving what happened and that could be the experience, as if they're back at, at the assault, reliving it. So that could be visual, that she sees it, she smells it, uh, she hears it, could, uh, could be body sensations or pain. So it's really important you help her think in the present, you think in present reality. So I teach them to focus on what's real, the present location, who is with them. And to say things like, this is not real, this vision will not hurt me. And then to refocus by thinking that they are safe at home with someone safe. Um, it's easy, it would be very easy for the person to develop something where they're not living in the present. Their mind naturally disengages and goes to whatever keeps coming into their mind. 
So the absent-minded, I don't mean by that forgetful. What I mean by that is that their mind is on other things. They're absent from the present. And then to help them help them with re-engaging in what's truthful, what's helpful, what's life-giving, what's biblical, and, and in the present. Um, the kid experienced dissociation, or that's a secular term. That, what that means is they disengage from their thinking. So they split off um, and fragment an overwhelming experience. So they could have convinced themselves, this is not happening to me, I'm an onlooker. So bad dream, they go to a fantasy location or enter a pretend event. This is especially happens, I've heard this many times from children who are sexually abused, where the, while it's happening to them, they, they, they disengage and they, they, they pretend they're somewhere else. And they could carry that on into life where anything that's, Un- is, is upsetting for them or uncomfortable for them they, they disengage that, uh, and while that's helpful uh, in the short term for them because it helps them survive in the long term it's very destructive so they really, they'll really need help with thinking in the present keeping their, their minds focused on what's true what's life giving what's biblical what's present so the consequences it could result in them feeling indifferent emotionally detached passive they're no longer fully conscious of what's happening. They may continue to dissociate to avoid related thoughts, feelings and situations or activities. And it can lead to function, not functioning in reality, in the present, and causing future relationship difficulties such as losing their job and sleep issues. So here's someone, uh, um, an Aphrodite Matsakis, can't pronounce her name, Notes 15 common thinking errors. So this is someone done a lot of research for um, people people who've been raped and uh, thinking errors that keep coming back. It's important to be aware of these things because you might see your friend uh, experiencing the same hindsight bias. They could have known what was going to happen before it was possible to know it or confuse the possibility of preventing the assault with the belief that they caused it. Or failing to understand that some reactions to trauma are beyond the control of personal willpower. I already mentioned freezing. Evaluating what they did based on information discovered after the assault or an option thought of after the rape. Judging reactions against improbable options not found in the real world. Feeling guilty for being in a lose-lose situation. Judging themselves based on what happened. So what happened to them is who they are as a human being. Considering only the possible positive outcomes of a ten action. If I'd gone home the other way, I would not have been raped. If she'd gone home the other way, something worse could have happened to her. Um, using only their emotional reactions as a test of the soundness of their decisions and actions. All or nothing thinking. Exaggerating or minimising the meaning of an event. And catastrophizing by believing that the only possible outcome would be the worst possible one. And believing that they alone were responsible for the assault by ignoring the total number of elements involved in their complex relationships. Personalization. So they they, they interpret everything as if it's about that that they themselves, who they are as a person because of what happened to them, or externalization of view of themselves by judging self by someone else's standards. So it's important to think about how do they see themselves, how do they understand themselves. It's quite understandable that they may come to see themselves as a failure, defiled, dirty, a fool without value, lacking in intelligence, and maybe disgusted with themselves. If you think about their emotions, blame and guilt, uh, they could feel that they were responsible for what happened to them, or feel guilty for what happened to them. Uh, if they grew up as a Christian and were keeping themselves morally pure for their spouse and they've engaged in against their wishes engaged in sexual activity some victims feel guilty about that even though that's not their fault some people feel guilty about that so false guilt it's common for them to be blamed or blame someone else ruminating may lead to becoming angry withdrawn and feeling depressed so blame must be put on the perpetrator it was their fault now this is a very difficult thing to say. So please hear me out. The victim is not responsible for the rape. They are not guilty for that. But they might feel guilty for any sin that was involved. So say they were drunk. 
they were uncon they were unable to control themselves by control themselves I mean they were out of it because they were drunk they may feel guilty for that and you need to address that so I'm not saying that in any way they were responsible for the rape but if there's anything going on around the circumstances and again I'm not saying that the drunkenness caused the rape that's not what I'm saying but they need help with the whole lifestyle uh, as well wisdom issues doubt they'll doubt themselves and what is going on they may doubt that because of the difference between their experience and preconceived notions of rape and that can progress to questioning their ability to think have value opinion, valuable opinions and who they are as a person could experience sorrow and grief and this will be experienced as they mourn they could grieve the loss of trust the ability to have power over their own body and the loss of dignity I would expect that they would experience anger because the anger toward the perpetrator are those who did not provide adequate support or understanding. And this anger can be intense because of the depths of the pain, humiliation, the inability to protect themselves, the injustice of the attack, and that it continues to have a hold over their life. And if it turns inward, they can become withdrawn and depressed or aggressive. So the nature of anger, anger comes from a judgment that you're against something or perceive it to be wrong. And there's right to be angry about the evil of rape. Righteous anger includes a sin that has occurred, a concern for the glory of God, and a righteous expression. So it's right to be angry about the evil of rape. So rape is a sin and it's against God. So it's right to be angry about it. But you'll need to walk alongside them to help them so that their anger does not become sinful. While I'm saying it's right to be angry, if that's all we say, then they could become an angry, bitter person because the angry thoughts that, are, that they have about the situation could end up controlling their life, be, be there years later. So they'll need a lot of help with how, what do you do with that anger? What does that look like? How can you know the Lord? How can you experience the Lord bringing his life into the situation? Shame. They feel that there's something inherently wrong with them. And that comes from feeling helpless, violated, degraded and humiliated. And if those close to them criticize, blame or make comments based on false presuppositions, their shame may be compounded. And I think of depression. So influences toward depression, they'll struggle with it if they believe that they are a failure. They've lost trust, they live in guilt, fear, anger or sleeping problems. So you help, it, help them live out the hope that they have in Christ. And this takes a time. What, what I'm saying here is ideal situation. And this, this is a long-term approach. You work at bit by bit in a very slow and compassionate way. So you're working on the thinking patterns, keeping a schedule, taking regular physical exercise, having social contact, having set times for going to bed and getting up in the morning and developing healthy eating patterns. These are things that need to go one by one. For example, I, I would like you to be up by nine o'clock in the morning next week and then the following week be up by nine and have your bed made i'm not expecting in three weeks for them to be able to do all that i've just listed there that could be a year two years of working with them step by step to be able to help them help them really knowing the person how they're thinking how they're functioning really knowing how their mind is and helping them bring truth to that situation it takes really a lot of work and a lot of uh, walking alongside someone and helping them their behavior, expressions of fear in their behavior. Uh, you can see expressions of fear during the attack and in and, and the aftermath where we, they could be isolating themselves. We think of uh, making sure all the, the doors are locked, that they're constantly um, checking that there's no one in the car. So the, the, the fear could affect their physical health, their relationships, and they could isolate themselves as well. So this leads to things like what's known as obsessive compulsive behavior. Obsessions are the things that are on their mind and uh, and they can't, 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 they're always on their mind, can't get them out of their mind. And then they do something that's able to help them get rid of that obsession. So then they need to engage in this behavior to get rid of the obsession that becomes compulsive. So that's because obsessive compulsive behavior, for example, always um, 
checking if the door is locked or not 20 times. Escapism. Um, examples of escapism would be not going out at all, drinking, uh, avoiding people. Uh, but you become isolated, you become lonely. It affects your mind, it affects your social life, it affects your spiritual life. So again, looking at the, the whole as the whole of that person's life at the right time, not at the start. I'm talking about way down the line where you're looking at how they're living their uh, how they're living their life, how they're structuring their time, what they're doing in their evenings. Um, I've I've heard examples of of people who, who would who lived on their own and they had developed a fantasy world where in their minds they were talking to people and they had a fantasy family life that was safe. Uh, you need to help people in a compassionate way with um, living in the present with the Lord. Not just, oh, don't, don't engage in that. That's, that's sinful. No, of course not. You want to come alongside them and help them with what are you, what are you thinking? What is truthful? What's helpful? Uh, bit by bit, rebuilding a life around Christ and the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Relationships will be impacted as well. There'll be trust is broken. Can you trust people? If you've gone through such awful trauma, can you trust someone? Especially men. Are men to be trusted? Can she trust her spouse? Um, so it's really important that she has community around her. The people who are faithful to the word and she, that can be trusted. Um, and she could be emotional. Like, and it's a very different. We talked about isolation. She could be a uh, different place emotionally than usually is. We've, we've discussed this. So the, the community around her has an understanding of this and supports her even when she's being different than she usually is. And taking her seriously, uh, being there for her, um, being patient long term, helping her rebuild her life and helping the Lord bring his life and redeem the evil of what she's gone through. She might be fearful of speaking out. If she was to say that she'd been raped um maybe the person who did it is got a higher function in society in our social circle perhaps even in our church and she won't be believed and she'll be punished for it um she might not have told her spouse even about what's happened and can you imagine that she's gone through this the results that i've been describing and then her spouse sees all this but doesn't understand why um uh, so both need help there's no boundaries uh, I don't mean selfishness here. I mean normal things that human beings do not cross in relation to each other. So boundaries, um, those have been crossed and have violated. And she could struggle with what's appropriate and will need help in the long term about that. The impact affects her thinking, knowing and evaluating thinking, how she views herself, how she views other people, how she views her life. And understanding what she's thinking and evaluating that with scripture, what's life giving, so that she's thinking about herself in all areas of her life in a biblical life giving way, and purposely thinking truth, purposely thinking what is life giving from the Lord. There's a lot of work because it's again I've said that many times. It's easiest thing in the world to be listening to ourselves and just to be dwelling in what's on our what comes naturally to our minds, especially when you go through something extremely painful, but what brings life is to look to scripture and what's true of Christ and who he is and what's true true, and to be helping her with that she will be a different person the more that she does that and I think even of dealing with fear and worry uh, looking at her identity who she is who she is as a believer truly is who Christ says that she is and that's what you find in scripture nothing and no one can affect that no matter how other people treat us that is who we truly are and to find and to be living out of who she is in Christ. Who she is, her identity is not a rape victim. Her identity is a child of God. Her identity is someone who belongs to Christ. And to help her be living out of that, that the Lord's taking the evil of that, of what she's gone through, and bringing his life in there. That her life is defined by Christ. Um, I think even overcoming fear, the well-known passage in Philippians 4 that speaks, th speaks about thinking what's true, what's helpful, what's noble. It talks about not being anxious for the Lord is near. Well, who is the Lord who is near? And then look at aspects of who God is. What does it mean that he knows all things, that he's everywhere, that he's just, that he's merciful, that he's loving, that he's gracious, that he's holy, that he's wrathful? Think that through with her. 
and who God is and help her to know who God is in her situation. Uh, and that's a way of overcoming fear. Even thinking of God will judge the evil of rape. He doesn't turn a blind eye to it. In time, he will judge it. So to help her with that. And then the difficult aspect of marriage, it will impact the spouse. They may know or they might not know. Uh, if he knows, he might think that she's defiled. Um, if he doesn't know, he'll be confused about what's going on with his wife. He could be very supportive. It's just important that both of them get help. Um, it's, I think sexually, it's very common that she'll get flashbacks or struggle sexually. So they need to really talk this through with each other in an understanding way um, and, and get help in that area. People who understand what's going on and get help for their marriage. And then think about the unmarried, that someone who's all on their own. They have no one around them to bring them out of what it is they're thinking about. They're, um, they, they, they get nothing, no one around them who's a natural prevention from engaging in addictions, for example. Or reminiscing or, or, or disengaging. They're all on their own. Um, they, need a, they need support and help. The importance of community around them. If it's a young person, they might think they'll never get married. And or think about, I, I know older women in their 80s who've been raped. And think of the fear that she has living on her own. A widow living on her own who's been raped. Will it happen to me again? So these are some of the aspects of, of helping someone who's gone through the horrible experience of rape. And I hope that will help you gain more understanding and compassion as you seek to support these people.